So, last class we started talking about spinoidal decomposition, <coughs> we will continue there. We said uh, you will see a spinoidal decompositions whenever you have a miscibility gap in the phase diagram, this is what we have said. If there is a miscibility gap in a phase diagram something like this, it will be reflected in the free energy composition diagram something like this right at any given temperature with within that. So, if you draw at a particular temperature you will see a free energy diagram which looks like this. And we always know that uh, towards the two pure metal ends the slope of free energy versus composition is minus infinity hmm, right. So, this actually in principle is uh, minus infinity and this also is minus infinity. Hmm. This is minus infinity if you are looking from this side uh, if you take this as a uh, solvent and A as a solute then it will be minus infinity, but if you are looking it from this angle it is plus infinity ok. So, now if you look at this uh, we will understand the spinoidal decomposition better if we try to see what is the first and second derivatives of this free energy. Let us try to see the first derivative uh, last class we just started talking about it. So, if you like uh, try to look at the first derivative of this free energy curve basically what we are looking at is what is the slope of this curve as a function of composition ok. So, try to see how the slope is changing as a function of composition start from one end uh, and start looking at how the slope is changing. If you look at it uh, when you start at pure A it is minus infinity and as you increase the concentration slowly the slope is increasing or decreasing slope is increasing and increases and reaches around 0 here is not it and then it continues to increase in the positive direction up to here it is in the negative direction uh, it is increasing. So, if I put somewhere some 0 here I start from a negative minus infinity and then if I draw a line. Uh, so, this up to here it goes and then here it becomes 0 and then it continues to increase on the positive side and the only difference is the slope of this increase the rate of this increase changes at some point. So, you can see that the slope of this is higher and higher as you go and at some stage again it starts becoming lower and lower. The slope is positive, but the only thing is the rate of change of that particular uh, slope is going to be different. So, as a result you will see that as you go along the slope is increasing and at a particular point the slope reaches a peak and then again starts decreasing and again reaches 0 somewhere here. So, if I take a point here it actually goes up and then comes down the slope of this is increasing up to a certain point and then from there it starts decreasing and reaches back to 0 and that particular point where it reaches a peak is a point of interest to us. We will see it what is that point means uh, and in the second direction again you will see the slope now starts decreasing the slope is negative now from here onwards it is negative and again uh, up to certain extent the slope keeps on increasing beyond a particular point the slope again starts decreasing and then comes back to 0 somewhere here. So, this if you look at it goes to 0 and then again this is positive and it is positive and goes to something like infinity it will be on plus infinity if you are looking at from this angle. So, you can see that basically in this domain and in this domain there is a change in the slope there in this domain the slope is always one sign only so, slope is always positive, but that positive is reaching a peak and then coming back to 0. Here the slope is always negative, 
but the negative is reaching a peak or you can call it as a trough instead of a peak and it is reaching a trough and again going up. Now, this particular thing if we call this as dou g by dou x and then now look at the second derivative of free energy, second derivative of uh, free energy is nothing but the slope of this. Now, look at the slope of this, how does this slope of this change and you can see this is positive slope and this positive slope keeps on decreasing initially it is plus infinity slope of this because this was minus infinity the slope of this will be almost like plus infinity and from plus infinity it keeps on decreasing and reaches around 0 here am I right. So, the slope of this is 0. So, if I now look at it uh, if I draw and then again draw this point you will see that from plus infinity it keeps on somewhere I will put again 0 for you. So, somewhere call this as 0. So, it is plus infinity and then slowly comes to 0 and then this particular portion this whole portion the slope is negative am I right slope is negative again here the slope is positive. So, somewhere here again this is a 0 slope and then it becomes positive. So, that means it is something like this, but in this period alone in this composition range alone it is negative slope and the negative slope again is in such a way that at this point the negative slope changes its curvature ok. In such a way that you see that negative slope it reaches a kind of a trough here. So, the slope is actually increasing up to here and then it is again decreasing. So, you can see the slope uh, in the in the absolute term is actually increasing and then again the slope is decreasing in such a way that it again comes to 0. So, this is in the negative this whole domain is negative this is negative this is positive. So, you can see that in this particular domain of composition the second derivative of the free energy dou square g by dou x square is negative and that basically uh, uh, boils down to two points somewhere here where the actually we say these are the two points where the dou square g by dou x square is 0 because those are the two 0 points and those two points where it is 0 uh, indicates uh, the points which we call them as spinodal points. And why are they significant because within those in the composition range characterized by these two spinodal points within that the free energy curve is like this beyond those two points the free energy curve is like this am I right. So, to the left of this point to the right of that point the free energy curve is of this shape and the moment you have a free energy curve of this shape yesterday we have seen in the last class that this is a stable state this is an unstable state. The moment you take any composition the composition would like to split into two phases of two different compositions whereas, if you are here it would not like to split because by splitting it is increasing the free energy here by splitting it is decreasing the free energy. So, the points which differentiate these two phenomena one with a stable state uh, of a single phase being stable and the other region where the single phase is not stable are those points which we call them as spinodal points and to understand where these points are you need to come to the second derivative and see where the second derivative is 0 and between those two compositions the second derivative is always negative. So, that is why we say spinodal decomposition occurs when the spin uh, second derivative of the free energy is negative. So, all those compositions where the second differential to the free energy versus composition is negative that whole regime is called spinodal regime. How do I now identify this on the phase diagram? So, the moment I draw a 
a particular temperature, let us say at room temperature, let us assume that this free energy composition diagram is drawn at room temperature. At room temperature, we know these two points. What are these two points? We call them as binodal points and where are those two points? Those two points are nothing but these two points. If I draw a common tangent, these two points correspond to these two points. Am I right? Now, between these two points, you have two compositions which are the so called the spinodal compositions, and those points are these two points. And obviously, the spinodal points have to lie within the binodal points, they cannot be outside the binodal points because from the nature of the curve itself, free energy curve, you can see that the two spinodal points are always within the two binodal points. If that is the case, somewhere here you will see two binodal points or two spinodal points. And if I draw the same free energy curve at different different temperatures, at each temperature you will get two binodal points and two spinodal points until you reach a temperature where the two binodal points actually merge into one single binodal point. And obviously, when the two binodals themselves merge into one single binodal, okay, then obviously, you will uh, see that the spinodal points also merge and that is this temperature, where the, where the miscibility gap vanishes. And so, that means, at various temperatures, I, I would get different, different compositions, if I draw and finally, if I join all of them, I get a curve like this. This is what we call it as spinodal curve. One can easily calculate this uh, by simply knowing what do you need to know to draw this free energy curve. Okay. Yes, you are right, you need G A G B. What else? Omega. Once you know these three, provided there is a rest, uh, assumption there when I say I need to know omega. What is the assumption? Yeah. Of course, omega is greater than 0, fine. Anything beyond that? The moment I say I need omega, uh, I am assuming something. It is a regular solution model, somebody has said that. That, that the system is following a regular solution model. If the system is not following a regular solution model, one omega is not sufficient for you. You need to consider the, if it is subregular, so omega A, omega B and so on. So, if I assume that it is a regular solution model, then simply once I need uh, know these three, at any given temperature, I can simply calculate the whole free energy curve. And once I calculate the free energy curve, uh, simply I ask the same uh, same uh, software to even calculate what is the dou square g by dou x square, uh, find out that composition where that is 0. And once you do that, you will be able to get these two points. And once you do it as a function of temperature, uh, at regular intervals of temperature, you will be able to easily generate this curve. And this is something which you will never be able to get if you simply do, uh, let us say, uh, thermal analysis. Miscibility gap you may be able to get uh, using thermal analysis, or to some extent, uh, the more easier technique rather than thermal analysis is what? If you want to see miscibility gap, uh, x ray x ray diffraction, because one single phase splits into two phases. How will you find out that uh, through x ray diffraction? Super lattice, there is no super lattice here, there is no ordered structure here. What, what will you see? If I take a single solid solution which is splitting into two solid solutions, when I do x ray diffraction, what will I see? One of you, yes, huh? two sets of peaks you will get of the same crystal structure, because the crystal structure is not changing here, it is an alpha of an FCC structure splitting into two alphas both having the FCC structure, then what is the difference Anisha? What is the difference between these two phases that are coming out? It is the composition, 
once the composition is different then the obviously the lattice parameter is different if the lattice parameter is different then the d spacings are different if the d spacings are different then the theta is different lambda equal to 2d sin theta is not it. So, basically you would have got a set of peaks whatever it is if it is an FCC you will get 2, 2 1 2 that kind of a pattern. So, this is let us say 1 1 1 peak this is 2 0 0 peak then 2 2 0 peak what is the next one how many have you done x-ray course 3 1 1 what is the next one yes perfect 2 2 2. So, this is how you get 2 1 2 I mean in fact uh, the moment you um, anybody gives you an x-ray diffraction pattern uh, and wants you to check whether it is really X, uh, FCC or not you will always see two peaks of them together and one and why does that happen because this is a square plus k square plus l square is 3. 3, 4, 8, 11, 12. So, 3 and 4 will be together, 8 will be separated, 11 and 12 will be together and so on and so forth. Okay. You will have again 16, 19 and 20 and so on. So, you will see always 2, 2 peaks will be together separated by 1 peak. This is a characteristic x-ray. Now, this if it is single alpha, now it is splitting into 2 alphas, then what you see is here this single alpha will be uh, if I put uh, you will see two peaks there one with a lower lattice parameter another with a higher lattice parameter and similarly this would also be it may come as two individual peaks or it could be overlapping because most of the time they will be overlapping because they are the lattice parameters are so close uh, that they actually will be overlapping and you actually need to do what is called deconvolution. Uh, if anybody has done x-ray diffraction they will know. So, you need to do deconvolution of the peaks to be able to see them separately or even do a very slow scan of XRD uh, to be able to see the two peaks separately. So, you will be able to see every peak will split into two peaks. And we will be able to clearly see yes this is the two phase structure and that is how you will be able to see that the spinodal has taken place. Now, let us come to again back to our spinodal curve and see what happens if I am inside the spinodal or outside the spinodal. In a spinodal we always talk whether you are inside the spinodal or you are outside the spinodal. What does that mean? It means that if I have two alloys, one alloy I choose this composition, another alloy I choose this composition and both of them are brought to this temperature, they are cooled to that temperature. What should happen in both these alloys? First of all in both these alloys single phase alpha is not stable, am I right? Because both these alloys are inside the miscibility gap. So, that means alpha has to split into alpha 1 plus alpha 2. The only question is how it splits is, is the difference. If I look at this alloy, alloy number 1, alloy number 1 if I look at it where does this alloy number 1 lie in the in the free energy uh, diagram? Yes, it is between the binodal and spinodal am I right. So, that means if I choose this composition that is a, call it as alloy 1, it is between the binodal and spinodal. Now, if I take this alloy at this temperature which is room temperature the free energy of single phase alpha is this okay call okay uh, let's uh, choose this so this is the single phase alpha free energy obviously you can see that this is higher than a two phase free energy which is this isn't it if alpha splits into alpha 1 plus alpha 2 if single phase alpha exists at that temperature it would have that free energy if it splits into alpha 1 plus alpha 2 the free energy of that mixture will be this. So, it clearly tells you that there is a decrease in the free energy when single phase alpha splits into two phases 
So, that means, the single phase alpha will not remain as single phase alpha, it would like to split, but how does this split takes place? If you look at, so let us assume the way we have seen in the last class that if alpha is of a particular composition, we call it as alloy 1 composition and if there is a small fluctuation in the composition that takes place because of the thermal vibrations. If such a composition fluctuation takes place, what does it mean? In a small region, the composition it goes up beyond the alloy composition, nominal composition. In some other region, it comes down. That means, if I show that as the one composition which has decreased in terms of the B content, another composition which has increased in terms of the B content, if I look at those two compositions and then take now, if I treat this as uh, alpha 1 and treat this as alpha 2 and take what is the free energy of the mixture of this alpha 1 plus alpha 2. That free energy mixture will always be uh, identified by joining a line uh, between those two spots. If I enlarge this for you, so let us say let us enlarge this portion. I am talking of an alloy composition somewhere here. Uh, so, this is the composition, it is splitting into two, I mean just for the sake of uh, understanding, I drew it this way, actually it is a straight line, assume it to be a straight line. So, this straight line which is joining these two spots, uh, one is alpha 1 composition, another is alpha 2 composition, the free energy of such a mixture is this. So, if alpha splits into uh, two compositions of alpha 1 and alpha 2, the free energy there is an increase in the free energy. So, obviously, this alpha will not give alpha 1 plus alpha 2 by this process of splitting. Then what, what is the way it can give you, uh, it uh, can finally, give you alpha 1 plus alpha 2, because it cannot remain as alpha, alpha is not stable at that temperature. So, alpha somehow wants to become alpha 1 plus alpha 2, how does that happen? To understand that, what you have to do is at this particular composition, if I draw a tangent, let us see I draw a tangent for that alloy composition. Once I draw a tangent, I see that uh, the composition that can nucleate from alpha, that can come out of alpha which is stable are only those compositions which are beyond this point. Once it is beyond that point, the all the free energies are below the tangent, that, that means there is a driving force for such a. So, that means a, the only composition that can and if you take any composition which is near to that alloy composition, all the compositions near to the alloy composition are always above the tangent. That means, the only way the alpha can become a stable state is that it can precipitate something else whose composition is far off from its original composition. And if something is coming out which has a composition far off from the original composition, that can only happen by a nucleation and growth. So, that means, this alpha 2 of different different compositions can actually nucleate and then the question is which one will nucleate, always the one with the highest driving force will try to nucleate. So, so, that means, inside the alpha, there will be compositional fluctuations take place at the, at a particular temperature and in a small region, the cup, uh, some the B atoms come nearer in such a way that once their composition becomes of that of this, suddenly that particular region becomes alpha 2 and that alpha 2 which gets nucleated here and there. Now, it starts growing, growing how by, by the uh, atoms solute atoms joining from the matrix to the precipitate and this is exactly similar to our precipitation process, where we are talking of theta coming out or beta coming out from alpha, exactly similarly here the only difference between this process and what we talked about precipitation is what? There the, the second phase that is coming out would possibly have a different composition, different structure. 
theta or, or some beta coming out of alpha is a different structure. Here the second phase that is coming out will have the same structure as the first phase. So, there is not major problem in terms of coherency problems. Okay. The only uh, coherency problem comes is only because this lattice parameter is different. So, the strain will be different. Structure is the same lattice parameter is different. So, the strain is still involved and the interfacial energy problems will not be there much because the structure is the same. So, it is alpha nucleating inside another alpha. So, FCC nucleating inside another FCC excepting the strain energy uh, surface energy problem will not be there for it. So, it will nucleate at some regions could be grain boundaries could be within the grain uh, usually it occurs at the grain boundaries because they are a high energy regions and that when it nucleates then the moment it nucleates you will see the situation is something like this. The moment alpha 2 nucleates then the alpha which is adjacent to that alpha 2 can only have this composition because the moment alpha 2 nucleates inside the alpha which is surrounding that alpha 2 has to be in equilibrium with alpha, alpha 2. So, that is why that alpha will immediately change its composition and this is also physically easy to understand because we said all the atoms the solute atoms from a small region have come together and become rich in uh, the solute and then alpha 2 has precipitated out. So, surrounding that alpha 2 obviously, the solute atoms get depleted and that is how you see that this alpha 2 the moment it comes out the alpha around it will have a lower composition in comparison to the alpha which is far away from here. So, if this is a this alpha 2 will have a lower composition alpha here will have the starting composition which is the we called it as alloy 1 and this is exactly similar to precipitation that we have seen. The only difference being that the structure of alpha 2 is same as that of this and in fact if, uh, if you look at the G P Jones. G P Jones situation is exactly like there. So, there also the structure of the G P Jones is same as that of the, the matrix. So, so, that there the problem is because the equilibrium phase is not able to come out uh, being a different structure. So, G P Jones which are the transient phases that are coming out. Here the equilibrium phase itself comes out, uh, but the equilibrium phase has a composition far away from the, from the parent phase that you are starting with. So, so you can if you see one more precipitate somewhere here you will see this kind of a situation. So, you have one precipitate another precipitate between these two the alpha will have a higher composition similar to that of the alloy composition, but near the precipitate the composition is small and if this happens at time t equal to 0 as a function of time if you see slowly the atom solute atoms start moving in this direction and what would be the result? There are two results one alpha 2 size increases second is the composition of alpha within the matrix will come down. So, that means you will see slowly this would grow and this composition would not change this composition is fixed for the temperature and only thing is you would see that this would decrease and slowly after some time it would become something like this. So, the alpha 1 uh, the alpha with which you have started has actually got converted to what is called alpha 1 now. So, between the two alpha 2s what you would uh, what would remain is what is called alpha 1 which was originally called alpha. Okay. So, this would have a lower composition this would have a higher composition. So, you will have a, a matrix of alpha 1 inside which you will have precipitates of alpha 2 that is how the whole uh, microstructure would look like after the whole uh, process is finished. This is for the alloy 1 clear. If I now choose alloy 2, alloy 2 would undergo the same decomposition in an entirely different fashion. The reason is simple. Now, I do not have uh, the situation like this, I have alloy 2 is falling within the spin order, am I right? 
So, the composition that I am choosing is between the two spinodal points right. So, that uh, then I can say that this alloy is within the spinodal whereas, alloy 1 is outside the spinodal for that particular temperature. So, if it is within the spinodal that means, my alloy composition is somewhere here wherever it is somewhere between the two spinodal that means, my alloy composition if these are the two spinodal points my alloy composition is somewhere here. If that is the case uh, in the free energy curve then this one uh, for it to split into two phases is very easy. That means, if I draw a tangent at that composition if I draw a tangent at that composition the compositions which are adjacent to that alloy composition can nucleate because there is a driving force any composition. So, if I draw a tangent here to that alloy composition any small deviation from this alloy composition has a lower free energy with respect to the tangent and that is the reason why a small fluctuation like this with one region becoming uh, uh, depleted in solute another region becoming enriched in solute can be stable because that would cause a decrease in the free energy with respect to the alloy. But if you remember the overall driving force if I again redraw this for your sake. We have chosen one alloy which this is the two spinodal points we have chosen one alloy in which we said the driving force is this this is the driving force. In the other alloy which we have chosen here the, the driving force for decomposition is this the overall driving force is very large hmm? not only that the overall driving force is very large but also because the composition is falling within the spinodal a small fluctuation in the composition can be a stable and then this fluctuation will start growing further and further until the composition reaches that. So, it starts with a small fluctuation and the, the, the both the fluctuations start becoming bigger and bigger at every stage there is a decrease in the free energy. and the final driving force is reached as a function of time and as a result you can see this fluctuation grows and grows the wavelength is whatever is the initial wavelength. So, the composition once there is some wave that is created that wave depends on that uh, diffusivity at that particular temperature. Once a certain wave uh, is created certain fluctuation wave is created that wavelength gets fixed and the only the amplitude changes. Because the, the, the atomic jumps at any given temperature are fixed depends on the structure and also depends on the temperature. So, once the atomic jumps are fixed then this wavelength gets fixed it depends on that particular uh, temperature and for the particular structure whatever structure that we are talking about. And once that happens you will see that this happens and finally, you will see that this if you compare this with uh, the previous one the final stage is the same in both the cases. The only difference is uh, the distance between the, the two precipitates in a, in a normal case of alloy 1 could be much larger and this uh, uh, the, the precipitate I mean if I want to call them as precipitates they are not really precipitate the, the second phase that is nucleating out of it uh, can be precipitating uh, can be forming at the grain boundaries or some high energy regions whereas, here everything happens homogeneously within the material. 
and there is no activation barrier for that. That is why you say spinoidal decomposition there is no activation barrier because it is a small fluctuation thermal fluctuations at any temperature will take place. So, and as a result there is no activation barrier for this and in fact there is a, a way to calculate the activation barrier also I mean measure the activation barrier people do it regularly. For example, if I can show you that. One way to show the activation barrier is if you have a region like this, uh, if I take an alloy of this composition, draw a tangent for this alloy, this alloy is let us call it as alloy 1, which is outside the spinodal. And if you want to see what is the activation barrier for uh, the nucleation for this alloy, activation barrier usually people obtain by drawing a parallel to this tangent. If you draw a parallel to this tangent, uh, so that you get another tangent which is uh, touching one of the composition, the distance between the vertical distance between these two would indicate the activation barrier. One can derive this, okay. let us not go into the greater details of it, but that gives you an idea of what is the activation barrier. And as you shift your composition towards the spinodal, if this is the spinodal, uh, at the spinodal if you draw a tangent, okay, again try to find out the parallel to that, uh, you would see that the distance vanishes to 0, because at this point uh, it is not inside it will be outside it will be something like that okay so as a result both the tangents uh, would actually merge into each other so you would see that this this distance as i go from here to here it will keep on decreasing and finally it merges okay that is one way to graphically show that but physically we can easily understand that activation energy he does not take whatever activation energy that is there for diffusion will still remain okay because diffusion has to take place so uh, so that activation energy will be there but there is no activation energy for the for the nucleation of the phrases because there is nothing nucleating this is not a nucleation event uh, unlike the alloy one case where something has to nucleate uh, and its composition is entirely different from this. So, all the atoms have to travel. So, there is a, a lot of uh, diffusion that is involved long range diffusion that is involved here it is all a short range diffusion and as a result the activation energy for this is 0. So, that is how you see a spinodal and as a result even in the microstructure also would look entirely different. A spinodal uh, decomposed microstructure if you carefully observe uh, it will be homogeneously distributed uh, different uh, you know gray levels one is slightly a higher composition other is if you really try to etch the surface let us say uh, be, uh, with uh, with some etchant uh, and if this etchant is uh, sensitive to the composition you will be able to see uh, uh, the, the gray and darker regions uh, inside the thing on a very 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 small scale nano scale obviously you do not have an optical microscope to show that. So, the only way we do is we go to an electron microscope in an electron microscope how do I differentiate different regions of different of course yeah if you can use a SEM scanning electron microscope luckily now we have uh, SEMs that are available which can really go to the nanometer levels uh, which are called FEG SEMs uh, otherwise the older generation SEMs you would not be able to see really a 10 nanometer kind of a modulation inside will not be able to you will not be able to see whereas, in a FEG SCM it is possible, but if you want to go to a transmission electron microscope and try to see how do you see where is the where is the contrast comes uh, where does the contrast come from in a transmission electron microscope. Anybody did any course on microscopy? No. Nobody knows. 
why do you see some contrast in a in a TEM? Why some regions look black? Why some regions look white? There are two types of scattering in in electron microscope TEM in a TEM. One is called diffraction contrast. Okay, another is called phase contrast. Okay, diffraction contrast comes wherever you are the atomic plane in that particular phase is properly oriented with respect to the beam such that the Bragg's law is satisfied it gives you a dark region because it gets diffracted. Hmm? Otherwise there is another way to look at it which is what is called the phase contrast where you see the regions which have a different composition. The moment you have a different composition obviously it also means that it has different concentration of electrons. For example, if you take a aluminum copper region, okay, one is aluminum rich region, another is copper rich region. Okay. Copper has different valency electrons, al aluminum has different valency electrons. So, as a result the region where you have copper rich regions will have different electron concentration. If there is a different electron concentration, the electron beam which is going through gets scattered by the electrons present inside that. So, as a result wherever you have more electrons that region looks darker wherever you have less electrons that region looks brighter. So, you will be able to see that on a very small scale. So, in TEM one can easily observe such kind of modulations uh, even at a early stage you will be able to see before the whole uh, the, uh, the wave grows to the final stage. But once it goes to the final stage it almost looks like uh, precipitates inside the matrix, but these precipitates the only difference between the alloy 1 and alloy 2 is they will be uniformly distributed within the grain within the grain ok. It is almost like a, a normal precipitation happening uh, within the grain excepting that a normal precipitation and this also are different in which way they will be different. A precipitation that we talked about it where G P Jones first come and then you have a theta double prime theta double prime and finally, it becomes theta. Uh, if you look at that microstructure and a spinodal microstructure would you be able to see some difference. Shape perfectly yes most of the cases this kind of uh, spinodal decomposition would be more or less uh, like uh, it's it's uh, it you would not be able to see the borders okay the interface is not very very sharp okay the interface is sharp there because there is a different structure that comes out uh. so you will be able to see uh, uh, the differences very easily because the interfaces are not sharper and the structures are same okay you can easily do a diffraction from both the regions and be able to see uh, that this is uh, both the phases have the exactly the same structure anyway. So, in case of actually a normal precipitate the moment G P Jones grow to theta double prime immediately the structure changes and at the G P Jones stage you will not be able to see anything the only way to see is by the strain contrast because the strain there is a lattice strain associated with that and that is what we will see in a minute here also there is also a strain that is associated. The moment you talk about a different composition the moment you talk about a different composition different composition means different lattice parameter am I right. So, that means in a particular region uh, this region will have a different lattice parameter in fact the lattice parameter in this region also is changing as a function of distance because the composition is changing similarly in this also the composition is changing. So, as a result this region and this region there will be always at the interface some kind of strain <coughs> this is what we call it as coherency strains similar to what we talk about coherency strains in precipitation. And because of this coherency strains though you have a driving force for the alpha to split into two the coherency strains would be a barrier for the split. As a result usually just because I have brought an alloy to a uh, within the spinodal does not mean that always this alloy will, will undergo a spinodal decomposition. So, you need an extra energy you that means you need a higher undercooling 
if you provide sufficient undercooling then you will have a sufficient driving force for this alloy to split into two by a spinoidal decomposition and as a result you would always see that there is another curve which we usually refer to as coherent spinoidal curve. That means, if I take this alloy, if I take the alloy to, to in principle the moment I reach below this particular point spinoidal decomposition should start, but just because I have reached this point spinoidal decomposition does not start unless you come to another point here where you have sufficient driving force to be able to take care of the coherency strains. So, unless you re come below this particular point you will not be able to see the, co uh, the spinoidal decomposition taking place. So, there is a, a, a separate curve a spinoidal curve which takes into account the co uh, coherency strains and that particular spinoidal curve is what we call it as a coherent spinoidal curve and in contrast this particular curve is what is called chemical spinoidal. because there you are only looking at chem composition you are not considering any strains there. So, this chemical spin order is something which comes simply from dou square g by dou, uh, dou x square being 0. So, that is the chemical spin order and there if you add the strain energy contribution then you will see that the free energy expression itself you have to change now uh, the free energy curve actually because of the strain goes up and then you would see this comes down and as a result in principle there may be cases for example, if I now carefully choose an alloy like this let us say somewhere between the coherent spin order uh, chemical spin order and coherent spin order that alloy I if I bring it to room temperature though I have brought it to room temperature because it is between the two spin orders it may not undergo spin order decomposition until you bring it to a sub zero temperature. So, that it crosses the coherent spin order and then only spin order decomposition will take place. Then what should happen to this alloy? This alloy also would undergo a decomposition like alloy 1. Though you are inside the spin order it will not undergo a spin order decomposition because of the strains that are involved. And if the strains are very large uh, then it would prefer rather than going through a spin order decomposition it would prefer nucleating an alpha 2 which has a different composition and then growth of that alpha 2 rather than a spin order decomposition. So, that is why we need to have an understanding of this coherent spin order and this coherent spin order basically the extent of which whether it is very close to the co uh, chemical spin order or far off from the chemical spin order because in some systems the coherent spin order can be even something like this far away from the chemical spin order why it depends on how much is the strain energy. For each system as the lattice parameter changes the strain changes the rate of change of strain with the lattice parameter decides the position of the coherent spin order. In some systems the, the, this strain, uh, the strain energy may be very small in such a case coherent spin order and chemical spin order will be almost close to each other you will not be able to differentiate them. So, that is how we need to have an understanding of the strain energy term in a particular system and it depends on different different crystal structures it will be different uh, and that gives you an idea of what is the spin order. So, and once you are within the spin order the spin order decomposition takes place ok we will stop with this and then continue later any doubts here so far whatever we have said you may ask me what is the uh, use of this spin order decomposition in fact people do not want spin order decomposition to take place hmm? the reason is the moment you have spin order decomposition the alloy has splits into two compositions uh, so people want to avoid spin order decomposition so they want to choose those systems where there is no miscibility gap or choose alloy compositions which are which do not fall into the spin order decomposition. So, that you can have a precipitation 
taking place rather than overall the composition is splitting into two. That means, in a small scale you have composition and the, free, uh, uh, the properties are going to be different. So, you have a inhomogeneous property inside the material. Huh? Uh, it depends uh, of course, one uh, it can be useful, but then strengthening mechanism uh, as a spinoidal decomposition may not be really a strengthening because, because it is also a solid solution. It is not a, a basically alpha is splitting into alpha 1 plus alpha 2 both are FCC. So, the alpha 2 that is coming out is not a hard phase anyway. So, uh, it is a, a solid solution does not give you a exceptional high strength. So, instead you choose a particular system where you have a precipitate with a different structure coming out that can give you a higher strengthening. Okay. Huh. Huh. Yes, how does it choose the composition? So, as I told you when you draw a tangent it can have all these compositions possible. Out of these compositions there are two uh, problems, one is it wants to choose let us say uh, the one with the highest driving force, because obviously this is the highest. As you go to higher you can see that this height keeps on decreasing, here also the height is smaller, but there is a problem for this to come out. In principle this alloy, this particular phase, a phase which is close to this composition should come out, because the amount of deviation from the alloy composition that is needed for this phase to come is smaller than the amount of deviation that is required for this. That means, if this if you are starting from an alloy composition of let us say 10 percent of B, if this is let us say 30 percent B and if this is 50 percent B let us say. So, that means, as the atoms accumulate in a small region and only the moment 30 percent accumulate in principle that is enough for the beta to nucleate beta or alpha 2 to nucleate. Here you need more accumulation to happen that means, atoms have to come together more to be able to do that, but this will always have the highest driving force. Okay because the, uh, the driving force is higher uh, and thermal fluctuations always anyway take place. So, because of the driving force is higher if you remember the nucleation kinetics uh, the delta G star is inversely proportional to the driving force, inversely proportional to the square of the driving force. So, as a result you would see that this would tend to form. Obviously, if you look from the from the point of view of only the thermal uh, movement the atomic vibrations alone this is true okay isn't it so if you simply look at only from the atom uh, view of atomic movement it is fine but if you look at what is the uh, uh, what is the r star for this 30% what is the r star for the uh, 50% r star for the 50% will be the smallest because the delta g is larger r star is smaller so you need a bigger r star if 30% has to nucleate you need a smaller R star if 50 percent has to nucleate. So, uh, though you know it is like a it is like a you know kind of a, uh, managing. So, you need a greater deviation, but the extent of the greater deviation uh, uh, smaller is enough. So, the system would choose that one. So, it is it is a very very interesting situations ok if you look at it I do not know how really system chooses uh, at least to uh, to understand it is really interesting ok we will stop here.